Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's with great pleasure that we are welcoming Dr. Yaniv Rosnai to give a presentation on uh, judicial review and its role in protecting democracy. Yaniv is no stranger to the law faculty. He has come through uh, Hong Kong many times. What many people do not know is that you know, he's, he wrote and he published this book with OUP. It is one of the most best-selling book that OUP has ever published. And I think he's one of the few law academics in the world that can retire on his royalties. <laughs> 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 and he's here today to answer one question on our behalf, which is, can courts protect democracy? And uh, with that, why don't I hand over the mic to Yannick? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. I'm really honored to be here again. I love this place, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so basically what I want to do is to present this work in progress, uh, and it's part of a larger project uh, uh, that uh, was initiated by the Spanish government on uh, protection of democracy and constitutional amendments, and I was asked to write a paper on judicial review of constitutional amendments and the protection of democracy. And basically in this paper, what I want to do is I want to deal with three main questions. Uh, uh, and uh, in this presentation, I'll touch it, uh, on each of these very briefly. The first one is, when we talk about protection of democracy, what exactly are we talking about? Uh, which type of democracy? Uh, because what we see now around the world, we see disagreements in various places about different notions of democracy. You see conflicting views on liberal versus illiberal democracy, uh, or in my country, Israel, you have this, this debate between substantive and formal notions of democracy. So what exactly are we talking about when we talk about democracy? That's the first question. The second question is, can actually courts deliver? Can courts protect democracy? Even if we think that it's part of their job, can they actually do it? Uh, so that would be uh, the second point, and then I'll explain why I also use the red heads example. And uh, the third question is, what should the court do when it is under pressure, under political pressure? When it is being bullied by the political branches, how should it react? So these are the three main questions I hope to deal with in this um, uh, presentation in, and in the paper. Uh, and I want to give first uh, the context for this presentation. It has a global concept, context and a local one. The global one is, uh, the democratic erosion that we see around the world, places like Poland, Hungary, Venezuela, Turkey, and many other places, we see a process uh, that Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Hoop uh, uh, describe as incremental, but ultimately still substantial decay in three basic predicates of democracy. Competitive election, liberal rights to speech and association, and the rule of law. And what's interesting about this process of democratic erosion is that in contrast with the past, in the past, if you had a constitutional breakdown, it was you know, an immediate one and violent one. You had a coup d'etat, a break of the control order. But the current democratic erosion process is very incremental, slowly but surely, and by using legal means. Right? And that's why it's very hard uh, to see it's coming. Uh, there are no tanks in the streets, uh, so you don't really know that you're under this process until you process it online. And so this is the global context. But there is also a local one uh, from which I'll bring various examples, and this is uh, uh, my own country, Israel. So just to give a very brief uh, background, in the early 1990s, Israel has gone through a constitutional revolution from a system of parliament sovereignty, or parliamentary supremacy, to a constitutional supremacy system. So we have uh, a list of several basic laws that have a constitutional status, and the court normally conducts judicial review. So if there's an ordinary law of parliament that contradicts a basic law, the court can declare such law as unconstitutional and void. So ordinary style of judicial review. Uh, but what we've seen in the last five or six years, we see a movement of counter-constitutional revolution. There are various attempts, legislative and political attempts, to weaken and circumvent uh, democratic checks and balances. Uh, there are various attempts to limit the court's authority to conduct judicial review, and uh, especially there are attempts or given threats against the court not to review basic laws themselves, 
constitutional status. Uh, so this is the local context uh, for my talk. And I actually want to start uh, with the first question of which democracy by showing you a very brief video, 40 seconds, of our minister, former minister of justice, Ayala Chaked. Ayala Chaked, the former minister of justice, was one of the leaders of this counter control revolution process. And I want to show you a film she uh, 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 published uh, a few months ago, just before the elections. It's very brief, 40 seconds. It's okay, it's okay. You can just read the, the subtitles and then I'll explain. So this is a commercial to a perfume, as if. So this is our former Minister of Justice, and uh, she was always being criticized by the left or by the liberals as being a fascist. Oh, you just want to undermine constitutional rights, you want to limit court's power, and she says, I'm a fascist? That's democracy. I represent the political majority. We, the majority, we represent the people. The people is sovereign, and if the people is sovereign, we can do whatever we want. Whatever the majority wants, we can do. And if you try to limit us, this is undemocratic. Because democracy is the will of the majority. Right? And when people uh, were treating her proposal as anti-democratic, then she said, she replied by saying, they declared Israel's democracy death so many times that it seems that not only cats have nine lives, but also our democracy. In her opinion, Israeli democracy is as healthy as a bull, and the process that are taking place actually strengthen Israel's democratic basis as reflecting majority will. So, uh, which type of democracy are we talking about? Uh, Ayala Chaked, the former Minister of Justice, and some of the people that support her views regard democracy as purely majoritarian. Whatever the majority wants, that's democracy. And other notions of democracy, liberal or substantive notions, are being under attack. Now, I think that the idea of purely majoritarian democracy uh, is completely wrong. Uh, uh, democracy is not two wolves and a sheep sitting uh, around the table and voting whom to have for, for dinner, right? Uh, if five people uh, 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 decide uh, or have a majority vote against the minority four and decide to kill the, vo the, the minority four people in a majoritarian decision, uh, that's not democratic, that's undemocratic, right? So democracy is not only a majoritarian uh, decision making. And here I think Jean Vern Werner Mueller is quite correct. So Mueller said that the fact that Europe's new authoritarians have come to power through free and fair elections does not lend democratic legitimacy to their efforts to transform entire political systems to their own advantage. Instead of describing them as illiberal, we should be calling them what they really are, undemocratic. And the context for this is uh, Viktor Orban from Hungary, who declared Hungary to be an illiberal democracy. Uh, now, I think this is uh, contradictory in terms. Uh, uh, you cannot have democracy uh, that is illiberal. Of course, it's not a binary thing. There is a scale, there is a spectrum. You can be a system more liberal or less liberal, but you cannot be an illiberal democracy. 
Even if you talk about only the most limited procedural notion of democracy, just elections. If you want to have free and fair elections, this must include some substantive principles and understanding. You can't have free and fair elections without freedom of speech. You can't have free and, uh, and fair elections without freedom of association, without notion of the rule of law, so that the government will not uh, uh, threaten people. Uh, you can't have a free and fair election without separation of powers, without the court to be able to supervise the process. So there is no such thing, formal aspect of democracy. Democracy inherently must include substantive aspects. So that's the first argument of the paper. Uh, the second argument is can actually courts deliver, can courts protect democracy? And I use the example of redheads. Who can save the redheads? Because uh, I know if uh, you are familiar with that, but some of the examples that are usually given in cases or in textbooks for a, a majority, a political majority that wants to, via, to undermine minorities' rights, they give the example of redheads. What if we now decide to kill all the redheads or to take away the voting rights of redheads, people with red hair? Uh, this is an arbitrary, obviously, decision. So our former minister uh, of justice, Chaket, said the following thing. I don't accept the presumption as if the court has absolute priority over parliament in the area of human rights protection, as if parliament hangs the redheads on electricity poles and the court goes one pole by, by other and taking them down. If parliament would enact a law that says all redheads must be hanged, the court will not be able to assist because society has become so corrupted. She repeated that in another speech where she said, if the Knesset, our parliament, <coughs> were to pass a law resigning the voting rights of women or red-haired people, this would signal the collapse of our democracy. In such a case, I don't think that even the court can save us from ourselves. Strong words. And this approach was followed by other people. Another former Minister of Justice, Professor Daniel Friedman, repeated the same thing. He said, there will not be any basic law that will cancel democracy. That's ridiculous. Uh, another public intellectual, Dr. Gadi Taub, said the following, if, God forbid, the majority of values will cease to be democratic, like the horror scenarios that are being thrown to the air in the current discussions, describing how the majority would decide to take away the right to vote of Arabs or redheads, then no court will be able to stop democracy's destruction. Wow. Yeah, that makes sense. How can court actually help in saving democracy? Well, I think that all these statements are incorrect. All these statements express a false dichotomy of democratic failure. According to Ayel Chaked and Dr. Gadi Taub and all these people that speak, they portray democracy uh, as a binary thing. Either we have a perfectly functioning democracy or a complete failure by our style. And if we have a complete failure, the court cannot rescue. But that's a false dichotomy. That's incorrect. In fact, between these two extremes, we have a vast spectrum in which courts can function as a useful stop sign or as a useful speed bump, even against constitutional reforms that aim to undermine or erode the constitutional order. And I want to give maybe just two or three examples. So in Taiwan, <clears throat> in the year 2000, the National Assembly, in 1999, the National Assembly decides to extend its term, uh, and the court blocks this constitutional reform. It says, no, this is abuse of power. You cannot do it. Likewise, last year in Uganda, the parliament decides to reform the constitution and extend its term from five to seven years, just because they can do it. And then the court says, no, you cannot do it. This is an unconstitutional constitutional change. You are undermining basic principles of our democracy. You cannot do it. Um, in Colombia, when President Uribe was supposed to serve only one term, one presidential term, amended the constitution to extend its term for a second consecutive term, the court allowed it. But when he tried to do it for the third time, to extend its term for the third time in a row, the court then blocked it. The court said, wait, if we allow three presidential terms, this, this would be undermining the very idea of term limits. We cannot have it. This is an unconstitutional constitutional change because you're already replacing the constitution with a new one and block that change. And President Uribe, a very uh, popular and strong president steps down peacefully, right? And then you have new elections. So these are just a few examples to show how courts can help to restore democracy back to the right track, 
right? Um, so this is, I think, the second argument uh, of the paper. And I, I support it by another mini argument uh, that refers to the, uh, the uh, soul of the mockless or the, uh, the preventative power of the court. Even if the court in a specific jurisdiction never reviewed judicial amendments, the court never even said it has the power to review constitutional amendments or constitutional reforms. The mere possibility, the mere threat that a court might intervene then affects the legislative process during drafting of constitutional amendments. Uh, and I'll give one example from Israel. <clears throat> Last year, the Israeli parliament enacted basic law, Israel as is the nation state of the Jewish people. According to this basic law, only Jews have the right to self-determination in Israel. This is obviously problematic for the Arab minority, which is 20% of the country. Uh, <clears throat> and what's even worse, this basic law does not mention the word equality or the word democracy. Uh, and this basic law was challenged, and we have 14 pending challenges before the High Court of Justice against this basic law. Uh, but what I'm interested in is the changes that took place during the legislative process. Now, the court in Israel, the High Court of Justice, never invalidated a basic law. It never even officially held that it has the authority to review a basic law. However, during the legislative process, there was one very problematic provision that said that if Jews want to have settlements or villages uh, of Jews only, where Arabs cannot live, this would be extremely problematic, this would be discriminatory, uh, and this would be an unconstitutional constitutional provision. And so the legislators, during the legislative process, changed it. They took it out, they redrafted it and gave a very vague provision that Jewish settlement is a national aim or something very symbolic, but they took it out. So I think that the mere possibility of a court invalidating a constitutional provision has the ability to assist in protecting democratic values. Uh, and here I want to move on um, to the final uh, uh, point. I have about five minutes, so right. Yeah. All right. To the final and, and third argument. Uh, what should courts do when they are under pressure, under political pressure? What we see nowadays in this process of democratic erosion, we see the political branches trying to capture the court uh, or threatening the court in order to achieve their own and narrow political gains. Uh, so how should courts react when they face the possibility of such a political backlash? Uh, uh, again, I'm going back to the Israeli framework, um, <clears throat> or the Israeli context. Here's a statement by Member of Parliament, uh, Moti Ogev, from the coalition, after a, a judicial decision he didn't really like. He said the following thing. A D9, a D9 is a bulldozer, you can see it in the photo. A D9 shovel should be used against the high court. We as the legislators will make sure to restrain the judicial rule in this country, the tail that weighs the dog. Uh, and we've heard similar statements recently in the UK following the Miller II case. Uh, one of the politicians said, oh, we need to destroy the Supreme Court. So uh, how should the court react when it's being threatened like that? Uh, he knows that if he gives a, I don't know, maybe an activist decision that would then bring a political backlash, that would undermine the court's authority, how should courts react? This is a very tough question. And what I'm doing <clears throat> in the paper, I want to ask whether courts should actually take into consideration the political ramifications and maybe go down the shelter uh, until the storm passes, uh, or maybe they should act differently. Maybe they should stand firm and, and actually say no, and be very strong and very activist. Uh, and what I try to do, it's a bit maybe far-fetched, but what I'm trying to do is to take studies from social psychology concerning bullies and how you should handle bullies and try to see whether we can apply some of the things that uh, uh, they say uh, to our scenarios. Now, of course, it's very difficult, it's very different, right, to take uh, psychology studies into these situations, but after all, we talk about people, we talk about humans, we talk about judges, we, see, we talk about politicians. Now, if you're being bullied, if you go to school the first day and the bully comes to you and takes your wallet, uh, if you give the wallet, uh, this will not stop in the second day. The bully will return and then we'll ask for more money. Uh, so going down the shelter, 
does not seem like a very good option. Because if it's a tsunami that comes, it will take you together with the shelter. Uh, and likewise, if you punch the bully between the eyes, uh, this will not go well. This will not end up well. This will just retaliate uh, and probably will not end up very uh, well for you. Uh, so I think if you tr will try to be extremely strong, I know I will do this, I will be very activist now and show how strong I as a judiciary, how strong I am, this will probably end up badly because ultimately the court does not have a sword or a purse. The political branches have a sword uh, and a purse and it will not end good for the court. So what I suggest, uh, I, those studies in psychology, they say, well, the best thing is to avoid it. But what do you do if you can't avoid, then you need to stand firm, say no, but then try to act business as usual. Uh, and I think this is perhaps the best option. The court should not be afraid or take into consideration political ramifications, political backlashes. It should act business as usual and not fear from uh, political reaction. It should not be over activist just to show. It should act as if it would act without any political ramifications. Uh, and I think Matthias Kuhn is correct when he recently said, I attended a conference where he spoke, and he said the following thing. He said, when under pressure from increasingly aggressive executive and legislative branches, the judicial branch's best option is to stick to its guns and simply do its job as it usually would. For maintaining democracy, it's important that judges press onwards with exercising their authority, even if keeping their heads down to weather the storm might seem like a more attractive option. Courts were not successful when they tried to become strategic actors and try to retrench back down and go into the meta metaphorical bunker to weather the storm. So you think, you think that if you go down and I'll be quiet now and I'll let the political branches do whatever they want, this doesn't end well. It didn't end well in Poland, it didn't end well in Hungary, and it will probably won't end well elsewhere. You need to stand and protect democracy uh, the best you can, as usually you would do. And if eventually, if eventually the political branches win in this battle, it's not a real battle, the metaphorical battle, if they win, okay, so be it. But at least you did the best you can in trying to protect democracy. <coughs> um, so uh, this is what I call the bully theory of judicial review, but following our brief discussion, I will change it to the anti-bully theory of judicial review, which is more accurate. And uh, if I have another minute, I'll just give two examples, uh, maybe two comparative examples. Uh, India. 1960s, 1970s in India, the court has been extremely activist, and the court took upon itself the authority even to review constitutional amendments. The parliament tried to conduct various constitutional uh, changes, uh, uh, which the court blocked, and the court said some constitutional changes, if they touch upon the basic principles of the constitution, they are illegitimate, we will not allow them. The political branches didn't like it, and then the political branches amended the parliament amended the constitution the following way. It said, we as parliament, when we exercise constituent power, we can do any change we want. We can take away rights, we can do any change we want. And no court can review or invalidate a constitutional amendment. The, political, the, uh, the judiciary reacted and the Supreme Court said, excuse me, this amendment itself is unconstitutional. Why? Because you as parliament, you are a limited organ acting under the constitution. And you cannot turn yourself into an unlimited organ. Therefore, this amendment itself is unconstitutional. In that scenario, in that example, the judiciary had, had the upper hand. Almost exactly the same thing happened in Hungary. Very recently, <clears throat> the court in 2012 gave a decision regarding some tra tra uh, transitory provisions in the new fundamental of the new constitution. Uh, and there is one paragraph where the court says, uh, we as the constitutional court, as guardians of the constitution, we also have the authority to review constitutional amendments uh, and even invalidate them if they would undermine the basic principles of the constitution. The parliament didn't like it. And the parliament amended the constitution with the fourth amendment, saying that no court can review constitutional amendments for their substance. You simply don't have this authority. This amendment was challenged before the Constitutional Court. The court then said, sorry, I don't have any authority. My hands are tied. I can't review it. 
And in this same amendment and some amendments that followed, other democratic institutions of the, of the Hungarian control order were severely undermined. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, the court uh, lost the battle. Uh, uh, the final thing I want to say, and I'll end with this, is that after all, the court only has its legitimacy. It has no uh, sword, uh, and the court will not be able to function, as I suggest, to protect democracy if it does not have uh, public support and it does not have uh, 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 social support. Uh, so it, eventually, I think, it all comes down to legitimacy and education concerning the role of the court in, in a democracy. Uh, I think I'll uh, end up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, before I open it up to the floor, perhaps I should ask a few questions and, you know, provoke or bully you. <laughs> so you articulated this anti-bully theory of judicial review, and if I may press you on your theory a little, right? So if we're talking that the court has a role to, uh, to stop bullying, either of the of, uh, so, uh, so this, sorry, you have this anti-bully theory judicial review. Can I press, press your, what do you exactly mean by this theory in practice? Right, there are three possibilities. One is that the court should have a, uh, a role in protecting the rights of the minority. So it's a rights protection function, right? So it's counter-majoritarian, right? The second is the court's role is to defend the integrity of the political or democratic process. So the process theories will say it's got to make sure that the system is democratic. Right? So there's a process theory. It's, in a way, it's majoritarian. And the third possibility of anti-bullying is the idea that the court's role is to de defend and uh, its uh, independence, to ensure that it's not taken over by the executive, is to guard its own turf. You know, and Stephen Gabam has argued, right, that in very weak democracies, in very fragile democracies, the role of the court is just what, number three. Mm -hmm. Whereas in very weak democracies where you can be punished easily, right, courts have no role, you know, trying to take on a very strong government. And in Hong Kong, arguably, process theory will not work. The court's more greater success has been protecting the rights of the minority that doesn't intrude on Beijing's control over the political system. Yeah. So, could you, in light of the, the, my taxonomy, could you elaborate on your anti-bullying theory? Right. Yeah. Your taxonomy is great because just when you started asking the question, I wrote these three. <laughs> uh, so I think so. The first obvious is rights protection and minority rights. When the majority, uh, is, uh, with the populist notion that uh, that the majoritarian uh, will can do whatever it wishes, and if the majority tries to abuse its power against the minority, obviously the court will intervene. But it's not just that, as we've seen, for example, now in Miller too. Uh, and in various other places, uh, we see rising power of executive, of executive power around the world. If the executive tries now to undermine uh, legislator and legislative powers, uh, I think the court should intervene. Uh, uh, this would seem bizarre because this is not an ordinary counter-majoritarian role, but the court should intervene even to protect the legislator. Uh, this may be some, it looks paternalistic in a way, but to protect the legislator sometimes from itself, and sometimes from encroachment by the executive, by the government. I'll give um, uh, uh, maybe just two examples, two quick examples from Israel. Uh, uh, in Israel, we have a rule of annual budget. The government must give the budget once a year to the parliament for approval. This is a basic principle of democracy to see how our taxes are being uh, used. Uh, in light of the uh, financial crisis around the world in 2009, uh, the government says, well, let's do a, a biennial one, once every two years just to see that we were on stable ground. They did it as an ad hoc constitutional amendment. Uh, and then, they said, it's very nice, very convenient. They said, okay, you know what? Let's do it another ad hoc amendment for another two years uh, as a pilot. This worked out fine. And then I said, this, one, this is very easy. We don't need to start negotiating with the parliament members. We, are, we have no fear, it's very convenient for the government. So then the government amended the constitution time and again, changed the annual budget to be annual one. They did it five times. And after the fifth time, after 10 years, we didn't have annual uh, budget being approved. The court told the, uh, uh, the, uh, the government, they said, uh, this is abuse of, of constituted power. You cannot do it. You're simply doing it for political convenience to circumvent this constitutional rule. We will not allow it again. Uh, 
Now, I supported this decision, but many people in Israel said, why are you intervening? This is a battle between the branches. This is a political issue between the legislator and the government. But no, here the government was undermining the legislator, undermining our parliament, uh, and I think the court was correct in intervening because it assisted in protecting democracy in that way. So this is just to give one example. The second one is judicial independence. Because what we see now around the world, when you as a leader, you want to undermine the democratic order. You want to have better chances in winning future elections. You want to take over or capture democratic institutions. What is the first thing you do? First thing you do, you take the court. You take the judiciary. You pack the court with your own people. Or well, you, you take ju- the military first. No, no, that's the thing, not necessarily. In the new wave, you don't need the military. You don't need the tanks. You don't need the generals. That's the beauty of it. No, you cannot have the military having a mutiny. So you must make sure you can control oh. the generals. Um, what you do, this is not a coup d'etat. You, change, you have the amendment power. You just amend the constitution and change the way judges are being elected. And you, you then decrease the uh, retirement age from 70 to 62. That's it. All the top strato judges are gone. And then you just appoint your own judges. And you extend the Supreme Court from, let's say, 12 to 11 judges to, I don't know, 15 judges. And then, and then you control the court. Uh, so I think the court should also be very strong in protecting its judicial independence. Uh, so it is not for, to protect the judiciary itself. You need to protect judicial independence in order to protect other democratic institutions and to better protect rights in the future. Uh, I think we had a question about the yeah. uh, So not surprisingly, uh, compelling and interesting thesis. And I think this is uh, also I don't know if this has been lurking in the back of your head as you're working through this stop sign speed bump thinking, but uh, an example of an opportunity for American public law scholarship to cross-pollinate comparative scholarship. There's so much they need to learn from us, but I'm very reminded of Dahl's thesis about in the Supreme Court as a national policymaker, and the emphasis on the thesis needs to be different for comparative audiences than for American audiences, right? Dahl's emphasis was look, whether you like it or not, the courts are a lagging average of electoral politics, comma, and therefore cannot resist forever, right? But for comparative audience, so because that's, he's addressing an audience of people who are used to thinking of the court as impregnable, unstoppable, a force of nature. We have the opposite problem, where you think of judicial review in courts now as really frail, weak creatures, and there we just need to put the emphasis on a different syllable in Dahl's thesis, which is whether you like it or not, courts can be a lagging average electoral politics and slow things down. They don't do nothing. And so it's actually the same point, but we're emphasizing the fact that they can, in fact, temporarily stop things, whereas for the American audience, we have to say they can only temporarily stop things. Mm-hmm. And so, so that, I think, is an opportunity to bring in Dahl's thesis and say, we need to remember that he was right, but for us, the lesson is different. Mm-hmm. Great point. I mean, the, this is fantastic, uh, David, thank you, I will definitely incorporate it. Uh, and the, the most important thing for me in this discussion is actually to, to, to say, okay, it is true that the court is not a perfect mechanism to save the most. <laughs> obviously, I don't want to put all my money on the court, on the judiciary, obviously. But the fact that, it, that the court, as a legal instrument, has a limited capacity, does not mean that it should be uh, emptied out of power. No, uh, we, should, we should still empower the court and trust the court. Uh, but not only the court, civil society as well, etc. Uh, but but we, we, need, we should not or never forget the important role of court in protecting democracy. All right, that's great. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I want to take up this point about um, you know, courts uh, should, uh, according to you, uh, stand firm and uh, do their business as usual, even if they face uh, political pressure, um, and uh, they should not be too strategic in terms of uh, retreating and, and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe uh, for a while and wait until the uh, opportunity. But I suppose this may not be a general rule that is applicable to all situations. Maybe it depends on who the people doing the bullying. Uh, so, so suppose someone, a school boy is being bullied uh, there can be different reactions, but the reactions may also have to be uh, to take into account who are the people doing the bullying and what are their characters. Just like people say that uh, gang, 
uh, Gandhi you know, practiced civil disobedience, uh, peaceful civil disobedience. And this, this worked because it was the British who were the, the colonizers. If it, it was not the British, but maybe the French or, or, or maybe you know, an oppressive regime like Hitler's, uh, I mean, any such... Uh, or Belgians <laughs> in Congo. Yeah, yeah, so any such uh, peaceful civil disobedience would not work. So maybe, uh, maybe we have to think about maybe that, what are the situations in which it may still be advisable for courts to be strategic and to retreat uh, uh, and identify the factors uh, in which uh, it may be wise for the courts to do so. Yeah, I think I think that's a yeah that's a common common that's a that's a very fair argument. I think I would have to somehow tune down the argument that this is not a really general uh, statement that is applicable to all jurisdictions. Obviously, I, I think you're correct. Uh, I, I think that perfectly makes sense. Yeah, but we need to consider not only. Uh, who the bully is, right? But also who's being bullied and and, and his uh, his role and status within the society. A court that is have much of esteem and uh, autonomy can do more maybe than other courts. So I would certainly have to use it. But the so, important thing here, the important thing here is that if you are, as a court has the authority to review constitutional amendments, constitutional norms, then you fear less from overrides and backlash. If you're a court with no such authority, and you will not have ordinary judicial review, and you think, oh, this is a highly contentious issue, what should they do? Uh, maybe, maybe I should just uh, be very restrained, because you're afraid that they will amend the Constitution to undermine your authority. But if they have the power to review even amendments, then you are less afraid of political ramifications. You can decide correctly according to what you think is just, because even if they will, uh, a constitutional amendment will come, regarding your own authority, you can still invalidate it. But when General Musharraf threatened uh, the rule, I mean, the, uh, uh, sorry, when the Chief Justice of Pakistan threatened the presidency of General Musharraf, he was fired along with all his Supreme Court. That's true, uh, but then you had lawyers out in the street. Yeah, but... Of course, it, so you need the support of the society. But again, I, th I think this goes to Albert's point. If, yeah. you, if you're facing a, a ruthless general, yeah. You might react differently than in your normal democratic society. And President yeah, uh, Duterte of Philippines, right, yeah. forced his chief justice to resign yeah. and uh, replace the chief justice with somebody who is most uh, obedient. Yeah, actually, what I want to add one, one more point because this slide mentions uh, that uh, there's this hindering machinery that allows the people, civil society, etc., to, mm -hmm. to 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 operate. So. So it depends also not only on who are the people doing the bullying, but also on who are the bystanders. It depends on, on the, the culture and, 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 and the institutions in that particular society, whether they will be able to, to give support to the judiciary who, who is resisting the bullying. Very good, you're right. I think it's also, also in the studies, the, 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 the psychology studies, if the audience come to your help, so you... you better able to face the, the bully, right? So yeah, that, that's a great point. Do you think I should narrow the scope of the paper to say what should courts do only in a democratic, in a perfectly, not perfectly, but in a democratic, in a reasonably functioning democracy, a democratic setting? I'll say that. And then I can avoid this issue. I think the role that courts play in a competitive, stable democracy will be very different from the role that courts play in a authoritarian or fragile democracy. Yeah. Well, in certain democracies where the generals, like Thailand, where the generals can just take over power easily, right? where the government doesn't control the military, the role of the court is very, very different from, say, the UK. Exactly. So I, I would. So Baroness Hill can succeed in the UK. Baroness Hill will not succeed in Thailand. Exactly. <laughs> and, and then I avoid the point. No, and then I avoid the point, the point of, uh, of um, Albert about who's the bull, who's, uh, who's bullying. Uh, okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry. Any more questions? Any yeah, maybe I, I'll ask one, one thing. Is that, um, when um, you mentioned all these statements from the Justice Minister, the ex-Justice Minister, actually she sounded a bit like um, Billings Leonard Hand in, her, in his uh, Bill of Rights speech. Um, for some reason, because he, um, Leonard Hand was somehow advocating a sort of smaller role for the court in the sense that, well, judicial review of legislation would not, would not work in his era. Um, and he was 
So, of course, he was saying he, he was wisely uh, asking uh, the uh, American society to be more vigilant. But then uh, here, the Israeli uh, former justice minister was, while well, using her charm to say that the people would speak. So now, so that therefore, of course, in some way, I'm saying what Delbert has already said. Uh, it depends. It depends on people. Sense, but also it's um, happening um, with all these um, I mix the, sig the different signals of what judicial review it is. Um, perhaps uh, the, would it be better for the um, for um, so what it, it depends on who, who the society who the society wishes to listen to, the politicians or the judge. Is the judge always wise, or is the politician who gives you what you what you what you want uh, always to be listened? Mm -hmm. Well, well, first in Israel, one of the one of the arguments of the politicians against the court usually is that the levels of trust of the people, the public in the judiciary, has been decreasing um, <clears throat> quite constantly in the last maybe uh, two decades or so. Nonetheless, the levels of trust of the people in the judiciary is still much higher than the level of trust of the people in the politicians. So I, 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 I would know. But what's interesting about what you've mentioned, when these politicians, not only in Israel, when the political leaders in Hungary and Poland and Turkey and Venezuela, when these, when the populist leaders talk about the people, they don't really talk about the people. They, right? They consider themselves, because they represent the political majority of the, of the, of the moment, they envision this one mythical people that exists. And they say, we, and only we, represent the people. And anyone who is not uh, aligning with us, anyone who does not agree with our approach, is either simply not part of we the people, so they alienate them, or is a traitor, or, uh, uh, or, or simply um, is a, uh, illegitimate or something. Um, so uh, this is, I think, just a populist notion. I don't think this is what really the people want. And it's very hard to understand what the real people want and what the people would, would want. I know Brexit, uh, a one-time referendum of 51 versus, let's say, 49%. That's the will of the people? I don't know. Uh, maybe the will of the people is examined uh, 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 maybe super-generationally or, or through various times. So I, I don't like all these uh, talks by politicians, but we represent the people. Well, uh, ju just a follow-up. I mean, this is a particular insight. Because this connects um, with the institutionalized people that all communist parties of the world say they represent. They are the vanguard of the people. And now the published politicians are saying that they represent what the people want. You know what I'm saying? But I don't think there's any politician who will say they do not represent the people. Well, <laughs> no, no, it's true. But there's a, there's the a difference theory. between saying you represent the people the and saying one that politician will say I do not represent the people. There are two theories. No, but but it's not the same. It's not yeah. the same as saying I represent the people. As saying me and only me, I speak for the people, and anyone else is illegitimate. It's something different. You can accept that there are pluralist decisions that some people don't agree with you, but saying that those who don't agree with me are illegitimate, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's already the populist thinking. Yeah. I don't think it's really the same. I, I think that the, the, the very traditional, or uh, maybe the old conservative theory of representation is that the constituents elect the MP to exercise his or her own judgment in parliament. That's, but then that does not mean strictly that he or she represents the people. Especially when you take into consideration problems of agency, mm -hmm. when the politicians uh, simply advantage their own interests uh, or promote their own uh, interests rather than the public interest. Mm -hmm. If you're as a politician trying out to amend the constitution to give yourself immunity from criminal charges, mm -hmm. or you change the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bar for um, being elected, uh, uh, just you elevate it to have better chances of winning the elections, this is not really representing the people, right? This is simply advancing your own narrow political uh, interests. 
Yes, I have a title. I'm from Taiwan, so I can really relate your arguments to Taiwan's situation. So in 1987, uh, Taiwan's martial law was lifted. Before that, you really didn't see the constitutional court play uh, an active role. But after the martial law was lifted, uh, you see, I would say, the constitutional court strategically uh, started to play a more leading role in uh, pushing in uh, reforms and declaring laws and the regulations on constitutional. So um, I guess I agree with the bystander's point, because after democratization, I think the, the society uh, has been rallying for human rights, for uh, democracy, for constitutionalism. And it wasn't until that time that the constitutional was really willing to uh, take up the burden of saying uh, that we are willing to stand with the people. Uh, and uh, there was, I guess, little cost for the constitutional court to do that. It would have been a huge cost if the constitutional court had done that before, uh, during the martial law period. What is your name, please? Uh, Yujian. Yujian, may I ask you what was the public reaction after interpretation 499 regarding the example I gave on the uh, extending the, the term the, of both? So it, it was uh, 1992 uh, when the, the constitutional, when the um, parliament, the legislature wanted to uh, extend forever the, the, the election term. Uh, it, it was uh, the Constitutional Court that said, no, you can't do this forever, and that won popular support. And I think at that time, the society was already saying, no, we need democracy, we need to move on, we cannot have uh, permanent representatives from mainland China to occupy Taiwan's legislature. So I, I think the it's Constitutional national Court national is really... But it, you're not talking about interpretation. No, I wasn't sorry. I, I probably, yes. He was asking yeah. one, which That's is about old. striking down the constitutional amendment in the year 2000. Okay, yeah. But um, even that case was actually, right, the ruling in that case that you're talking yeah. about was a case for which the constitutional court was handing a victory to Li Denghui, who was on the KMT. It was allowing his faction, so it was an intra-faction dispute. And he was handing victory to Li Denghui so that he can take over the party. So in a way, it was not that you know, liberal a decision. It was handing victory to the rising camp of the KMT. But 499, I think, is a better example in a way whereby the court really stopped right, the suspension of the National Assembly for, uh, from, uh, from handing down an amendment that would have uh, been highly anti-democratic. The both, I think, were landmark yes, they were, interpretations. Yeah. The first one in the year 1990 is, is it 261? Was it interpretation? I forgot the number. 263, I think. Oh, yeah, 26 something. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other one is 199. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'll let this one. But that was, for the first one, it was actually an intra party faction, mm -hmm. and the court was only handing victory to the one that's rising. Yeah. yeah. But then I think there was also some some extent of popular support. Yes, of course, definitely. Yeah. The, 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 the public was not happy with you know those derogatory legislators holding on to power indefinitely. Yeah. So, so it was politics dovetailing with public opinion, which will often make a decision even stronger, right? Which is something like Brexit. When politics matches public opinion, you would tend courts would be more secure. It's only when politics clashes with public opinion that cause our weakening. Uh, but I think you, Jim, made a very good point, which is that uh, in the, the case of Taiwan shows that a constitutional court can only yeah. operate effectively where there is a democratic uh, Absolutely, political yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I believe that. I, I want to add some uh, follow-up to um, um, Albert's point earlier. Uh, I, and, and I didn't mention it here, it's in the final slide. The court has another role in, in assisting democracy when it actually provokes public discussion. And this is an aspect that I think that is not being, uh, 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 not getting enough attention. Uh, usually, the debate in Israel is, oh, you're giving everything to the court to decide 
you're undermining uh, democratic deliberation, etc. That is not necessarily true. If you did, uh, for example, the basic law that I just mentioned, basic law is the, the nation state of the Jewish people, after the various challenges that were submitted to the High Court of Justice against this basic law, this started a huge public debate. You have opens in newspapers and people talking on the street about this basic law. Uh, so actually, here the court, the judiciary, acted as a uh, some catalyst to public debate. So I think it's another function uh, for a democratic setting that is uh, often ignored, uh, I think. Yeah, I think the, the best example in Asia where politics dovetails with public opinion was the removal of President Park Geun Hye, right? When 95% of the country wants her gone, and it was the right decision to make, which was so corrupt. Right. So when politics dovetails with public opinion, then the court becomes really, really strong when it hands out the decision. But imagine if the scenario was flipped around. What if it was 95% of the people wanting uh, things that she's innocent? Mm -hmm. It was a witch hunt. Yeah. <laughs> right, it was, you know, like what's playing out perhaps in the US, mm -hmm. uh, arguably in the US, right? What, what, sorry, what President Trump claims is going on in the US. But if it's 95% once. President Park to stay in office, I doubt the court would have done what it did. What the court would have done was to say, I think, right, that, you know, she has not been convicted, so let the criminal process complete, and then we'll decide, they'll punt the decision to the future. But when 95% wants her gone, then the court could decisively just remove her, and then enhance their stature, yeah. Yeah. and then they become heroes. Mm. Yeah, for the easy one. Okay, so I think, I want to add maybe one more sentence. Uh, obviously, courts can also undermine the democratic order. There is no doubt. The history from the US and elsewhere shows us where courts often uh, uh, infringe upon rights or, uh, uh, or undermine democratic values for sure. But I think the greater story in its totality, uh, I'm more afraid of the political branches. I don't know many countries or many democracies that have uh, failed or being destroyed because of the judiciary. I know many countries that have failed because of the political branches, and that's, I think, the bottom line. With, with neither person or sword, it's very hard to destroy a country. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have any last question? I, I have the last question oh, yes. about the, the Israeli law. Uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning that um, the court can review a, a, an ordinary law by relying on the basic law, is that right? And then you said that uh, there is no discussion about whether the basic law will be reviewed. So, so if the basic law has been reviewed, on what basis is it being reviewed? And can the legislature designate a law uh, as a basic law? So is, is it simply a designation? Uh, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's spot on. This is precisely the discussion we have now in Israel. So the thing is this. Uh, the only distinction between a, a law, an ordinary law, and a basic law is the title. You give it a title, basic law, and it's a basic law. No different procedure, no different process. You don't need a special majority. So in an ordinary majority, the parliament, in a day, or a day and a half, can enact a basic law, can change the constitution. Now, take into consideration, add to that the fact that the government, the executive, actually controls the legislative process. So the government can play with the Constitution any uh, way it wishes. Now, on which grounds would they review the basic law? That's a tough question. Uh, we need to search for some higher principles. So according to one argument, this would be our Declaration of Independence that functions maybe like a preamble in a way, this is the highest principles uh, that we as a state, when we were established, that's how we see ourselves. Uh, so that's one. Uh, another version can be maybe natural law or basic principles of constitutionalism. We don't really know. That's the debate. According to one argument, it is the limitation clause that exists in one of our basic laws, in basic law, human dignity, that can also limit uh, constitutional legislation. Right? And think about it. If you have a limitation clause, like an ordinary legislation uh, limitation that says no law shall infringe upon rights unless the violation is proportionate and necessary in a democratic society, then why should not this apply also to constitutional laws? Uh, an amendment is also a law, right? So this is another argument, but we still don't know which way uh, the court will take. Maybe the court will say, I don't have the authority. We don't know. 
All right. On that note, and uh, we had a really feisty and lively discussion. We rarely do, but you have provoked so much comments from all of us. I think we are fascinated by your discussion. We're grateful that you're here, and we hope you come back again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.